To begin our national news section, we have an article from the Associated Press. Uh, Veterans say rape cases mishandled covers a terrible academic that exists in the United States military where rape and abuse by fellow servicemen often goes unreported and unpunished. A federal class action lawsuit has been filed by more than a dozen female and two male current or former service members who say servicemen get away with rape and other sexual abuse and victims are too often ordered to continue to serve alongside those they say attack them. Some of the women have told their stories of verbal abuse, being called a whore and other degrading names, of being beaten in the face and even being raped in Iraq and a video of it being sent around their unit. These types of actions are not only a stain on the already tarnished name of the military, but is also the sign of a degenerate culture that allows and even covers up this type of evil. Next from Prison Planet, confirmed FBI got warning day before Oklahoma City bombing. Apparently, Terry Nichols was offered a deal to avoid the death penalty by a lawyer if he took responsibility for a phone call warning of the bombing, according to documents released by a Freedom of Information Act request from lawyer Jesse Trentadu, whose brother was tortured to death by the FBI since he resembled a man McVeigh robbed banks with. Trentadu has, quote, all but proven the attack on the Alfred, Alfred P. Murrah building was an inside job run by FBI agents who were handling Timothy McVeigh, end quote. There was also a box of explosives found which had prints of two other men whose names were redacted by the FBI. Trentadu says the evidence he has gathered proves that the FBI has been, quote, killing witnesses who have direct knowledge of the fact that the Oklahoma City bombing could not have gone ahead without the aid of FBI informants and that the government had prior knowledge of the attack on the Alfred P. Murrah building at least four months in advance, end quote. More evidence of another terrible attack being a false flag operation covered up by our government. The explosive charges outside in the van couldn't possibly have taken out the central columns of the building, and initial reports acknowledged that there were others working with McVeigh as seen in video evidence and undetonated charges found in the building. McVeigh, a military veteran, was confused and upset after questioning our presence in the Arab world. Watch cover-up in Oklahoma, free on Google Video. Before 9-11, Oklahoma City was used to justify the government encroaching on our freedoms on a terrorist platform. Now confirmed uh, through federal authorities that a second bomb has been found inside that federal building in Oklahoma City. At the present time, the medical teams downtown are unable to get into the wreckage to retrieve more of the injured because of the presence of other uh, bombs in the area. I've been told by the police department that just as soon as those bombs are defused, they will permit the medical teams to enter. The Justice Department is reporting that a second explosive device has been found. In fact, what we were told at the scene a few minutes ago was that, in fact, two different explosive devices were found in addition to the one that went off. The first bomb that was in the federal building did go off. It did the damage that you see right there. The second explosive was found and defused. The third explosive that was found, and they are working on right now as we speak, I understand, both the second and third explosives, if you can imagine this, were larger than the first. So try to imagine two Boy. or threefold happening mm -hmm. uh, what we've already seen there. It is just uh, incredible to think that there was that much heavy artillery that was somehow moved into the downtown Oklahoma City Federal Building. From the ABC News, Assassin's lawyer says Sirhan Sirhan was brainwashed. The lawyer of Sirhan Sirhan, the man alleged to have shot Robert Kennedy, has argued unsuccessfully before a California parole board hearing that Sirhan was the victim of a program of mind control or brainwashing and does not even remember the incident he has spent decades in prison for. This did not win over the parole board, who denied Sirhan Sirhan's release for the 14th time. If you're interested in mind control operations done by the government during this time, look up the program MKUltra and you will learn things that will shock you to your core. In the Dallas News, Obama honors former President George H.W. Bush with Medal of Freedom. In a testament to the false two-party system to socially engineer the population into thinking there's a democracy, Barack Obama bestowed Bush Sr. with the highest civilian award. Bush is a former CIA director connected to the assassination of JFK, pedophile scandals, drug running, terrorism, and much more. 
Many other corrupt and wicked men have been given the Medal of Freedom, such as billionaire Warren Buffett, whose Coca-Cola is responsible for lowering water tables overseas and hiring paramilitary death squads to kill union organizers. Tony Blair is another recipient who is also involved in bogus wars, pedophilia, and other undesirable behavior. From Press TV, activists arrested at Clinton's speech, this is an interview of 71-year-old former CIA analyst Ray McGovern, who describes having his back to Clinton to show that he was not in solidarity with her, quote, warmongering policies. He was then jumped on and dragged out of the room where nobody could see. He says, quote, for Hillary Clinton to be talking about peaceful means of protest in the same speech which she continued as she watched me directly in front of her being pounced on and violated is a little too much to take. Charged with unruly behavior, he will fight the charges and Veterans for Peace have demanded an apology with no response. Satellite signals were jammed and internet access was blocked for nearly the entire country. So this is America. The government this did is not America. want the Who are you? to communicate with each other and it did not want the press to communicate with the public. From Greg Palast, a Reagan killer coward con man, this is a reprint of an obituary written by Greg Palast, originally published in 2004 for Ronald Reagan, basically saying good riddance to him and the evils he helped perpetuate around the world. It is an entertaining read, like most of Palast's work, and highlights some of the destructive and downright evil things that Reagan was involved with. From overthrows, assassinations, drug runnings, and weapon sales, this man is no hero to be admired, but was a criminal that should have been prosecuted. Unfortunately, there will be no justice for the victims of Reagan's cruelty. From MSNBC, Congressman resides amid Craigslist scandal. In another example of the sexual deviance of many of our elected officials, Congressman Christopher Lee of New York's 26th District has been caught responding to sexual Craigslist ads even though the man is supposed to be married and be an example for society. This is actually quite common activity amongst many of the power elite in our society as it is a means of blackmail that can be used against anyone who gets out of line. The article also notes that Lee's resignation comes almost a year after Democrat Eric Massa resigned his seat in western New York's 29th congressional district amid an investigation into whether he sexually harassed male staffers. If people want to take part in this type of activity, they should not be representing their fellow citizens in Congress, that's for sure. Now from Wired, Obama nominates RIAA lawyer for Solicitor General. Rather than change, it's been more of the same from Obama. Donald Verrilli Jr. is the fifth lawyer from the Recording Industry Association of America that was appointed in Obama's administration. The Solicitor General is charged with defending the U.S. government, which reserves the right to refuse service to anyone and basically chooses whether or not you can sue them. Another Solicitor General function is submitting amicus cura briefs as a third party to influence court decisions. Verrilli helped take down Grokster and helped with a $1 billion copyright infringement case against YouTube, which was lost but is being appealed. He has argued that making copyrighted works available online is the same as copyright infringement. What does this guy think of libraries? To me, anything should be available online, just the same as it is at libraries. As far as I'm concerned, this is more fascist being placed in charge of what is supposed to be a free country. From Politico, House votes to overthrow czars. The House has voted 249 to 179 in favor of an amendment to a resolution that would block funding to various policy advisors of the Obama administration, also known as czars. It is indeed a disturbing trend to have an increasing amount of unelected officials in positions of real power. However, the fact that it has become partisan in a way is a shame. Republicans didn't seem to be complaining when Bush and his cronies were amassing too much power, and most Democrats don't seem to be complaining now when Obama and his appointees are doing the same. From Wired, House fails to extend Patriot Act spy powers. In a turn of good luck for the freedom-loving public, the House has not extended certain provisions of the Patriot Act that deal with spying on innocent citizens. Roving wiretaps, lone wolf taps, and business record taps are no longer legal in the United States. Despite opposition from the Obama administration, who wanted to keep the unconstitutional powers signed in by the Bush administration, the government may still be engaged in this activity, and we would have no way of knowing, but at least on the books, it isn't legal anymore. Of course, it could always be voted in again by another Congress. From ABC News, Aniston monitors Facebook pages. Aniston, Alabama is monitoring its employees' social networking for criticisms of the city to make sure that they hired loyal minions. They haven't specified any penalties, but obviously dissent will not be tolerated. And now from the Star Advertiser, online ban on boss criticism reversed. American Medical Response of Connecticut Incorporated was sued after firing 
an employee who criticized her boss. She received support from colleagues after a post on Facebook. Unfortunately, this is a settlement with other terms, not made public, and though it is a positive development, it doesn't set as strong of a precedent as may be needed to deter employers in the future. From the Washington Post, Bradley Manning, WikiLeaks alleged source faces 22 new charges. Charges that have been leveled against Manning include aiding the enemy, wrongfully causing intelligence to be published on the internet, knowing that it will be accessed by the enemy, and violating army regulations on information security. Specifically, the charge of aiding the enemy carries a maximum penalty of death, though prosecutors maintain they will not be seeking the death penalty. Another from Wired, Airmen, it's illegal for your kids to read WikiLeaks. This Air Force policy is enforced under the threat of espionage charges with the assumption that the content is classified and not to be viewed. An obvious preventative measure to keeping military families from learning about the unbridled tyranny that they are a part of via the brutal reality exposed by whistleblowers. Case in point, the collateral murder video of the ruthless extermination of Reuters journalists and Iraqis who were conversing uh, with the reporters. Army Private First Class Bradley Manning leaked the video of an obvious war crime and is now charged as a war criminal in return. From TechSpot, MPAA threatens to disconnect Google from the Internet. In a ridiculous attempt at threatening Google, the Motion Picture Association of America has warned that they could be disconnected from the Internet if they do not cease their copyright infringement activity. The activity the MPAA is most upset about is Google's public Wi-Fi service and copyright infringements by Google employees. There's no way that they could take Google off the Internet, and there's also no way that they will stop the sharing of information. So all the copyright Nazis should just stop wasting their time. From PC World, get internet access when your government shuts it down. This insightful article is something everyone should read in terms of using local networks in the event of government shutdown, like those initiated by tyrants in Egypt, Libya, Burma, and Nepal, to name a few instances. One tactic is connect wireless networks in a mesh using 56K modems and ham radio or others. Packet radio is an interesting long distance um, internet device that functions via radio waves. A whole market is emerging to combat shutdowns so people can stay in touch with friends and family or coordinate resistance to tyrannical threats. From Arts Technical, Supreme Court AT&T can't keep bad behavior a secret. The Supreme Court has ruled that personal privacy rights do not apply to corporations even though they are considered legal persons. This is actually quite an astounding ruling because the courts usually side with corporations, as the federal court did that heard this case before it was taken finally to the Supreme Court. The article states, this decision means that corporations cannot hide behind claims of personal privacy in order to protect their business practices from public scrutiny. Another from Ars Technica, Black Ops, how H.B. Gary wrote back doors for the government. Greg Hoagland, co-founder of a security firm, was funded with tax dollars to create malware as revealed in documents exposed by the hacker collective Anonymous. A document with deadly recipes for disaster was used as a surrogate for some of the malware. H.B. Gary was teamed up with Advanced Information Systems of General Dynamics to implant malware on target computers to install back doors for, quote, uninhibited electronic direct memory access. This includes getting passwords, usernames, and deleting or copying files while a rootkit remains cloaked and undetected on the system. Microsoft Outlook was another target the team was given to exploit. This is a frightening threat to anyone who isn't aligned with the U.S. government's version of reality. Clearly, these meddlings could have been used to dispatch the product of an apparent U.S.-Israeli joint venture called the Stuxnet virus, which infected and threatened to make Iran's nuclear reactor go critical. From ABC News, protesters take sta state capital in Wisconsin. Discusses the ongoing movement by state workers in Wisconsin to oppose a bill put forward by the governor that would strip away collective bargaining rights for state unions and require employees to give up more uh, for benefits and pensions. Tens of thousands of protesters flooded the streets of Madison to show their anger at the governor's proposal. It is good Americans are finally getting into the streets. The only unfortunate side to all of this is that it took until the government went after people's pensions and unions for them to stand up. The illegal wars, the torture prisons, the support for coups around the world by our government didn't seem to resonate with enough people, I guess. As with most situations, it has taken until people are personally affected for them to wake up to the fascism perpetuated by this government. 
now from InfoWars, police would absolutely use force on Wisconsin protesters. This further solidifies the fact that the government resorts to violence when you exercise your rights. The Wisconsin Law Enforcement Association Executive Board President Tracy Fur Fuller says officers would follow orders. She states, quote, I'm not even able to fathom that any of those police officers would not carry out whatever orders were given to do their job. Nazis shamelessly tried to claim that they were just taking orders. Seems the Wisconsin police state is eager to tyrannize protesters. 300 Wisconsin battle-hardened National Guardsmen were recalled from the illegal war in Iraq to possibly terrorize citizens at home. From the Daily Mail, Indiana Deputy AG fired after he urged police to use line driving ammunition on protesters. Jeffrey Cox, a deputy attorney general in Indiana, recently posted on Twitter that police should use live ammunition on protesters who have been occupying the state capital of Wisconsin. Does this guy think that this is Libya or something? It was right for him to be fired. He should be prosecuted for trying to incite a riot. As protests and opposition to government policies increase, police must stay on the side of the people and free speech and allow protests to continue. Do not obey orders to shoot your fellow American brothers and sisters who have taken to the streets in disgust of this government. Now from Arab news, labor protests draw thousands across the United States. Saturday, February 26th was a day demonstrations were held in solidarity with public sector workers threatened in Wisconsin. Some Americans were inspired by Egypt and have united in common cause with signs such as Wall Street is destroying America and we are all Wisconsin. Similar threats are looming in Ohio, Tennessee, Idaho, Indiana, Iowa, and Kansas to resolve budget issues that result from the insanely unstable construct the governments have created. It is absurd to take from common people while politicians and corporations pillage our country, often paying little or no taxes. Not to mention taxes dispensed via military industrial complex to kill innocents overseas or pay the Federal Reserve debt slavery. From the Tenth Amendment Center, first in the nation, Idaho House passes health care nullification. House Bill 117 passed the Idaho House of Representatives 49 to 20 and will effectively nullify the Federal Health Care Act, which requires all Americans to buy health insurance by 2014 or face fines and punishments. This is a huge blow again to the increasingly centralized powers of the federal government and the article notes that seven states have passed health care freedom acts to block health care mandates from being enforced. Eight states have passed firearms freedom acts. Fifteen states, most recently Arizona, are using the principles of the Tenth Amendment to actively defy federal laws on marijuana. From the Washington Times, federal deficit on track for a record this fiscal year, government debt to exceed U.S. economy. In 2011, our debt is going to jump $230 billion above the record in 2009 to $1.645 trillion. This is 102.6% of our gross domestic product, a measure of our entire economy. Debt is slavery, and we are more enslaved than ever. It should be blatantly clear that this banking elite want this when trillions are generated for bailing out banks and corporations rather than the people. Reducing unjust warmongering, cutting imports, implementing energy alternatives, expanded public transportation and localized food would have been a better strategy to alleviate the banker-engineered depression. You can't be surprised when scum like Geithner, Bernanke, and Summers are appointed to be in charge of our money systems. From Boston.com, U.S. trade deficit widens to $40.6 billion. As U.S. import values have gone up due to rising oil prices, the U.S. trade deficit has widened to $40.6 billion. This is a disturbing trend as more and more jobs are literally shipped overseas to be done by people who will ask way less to do the same job. Not surprisingly, the largest deficit imbalance the United States has with a single country recorded to date is with China. From the Washington Post, economists state local pension funds understate shortfall by $1.5 trillion or more. Covers the differing accounting methods that are used to determine future pension payouts and returns on investments. Many economists have been contending for years that the government methods are skewed and give a false representation of the true situation of pensions held by the state. In some states, the government is already starting pay reductions to pay into the pension system that is failing. This process has already been carried out in other countries that have been fleeced by the financial elite of the world, which is why so many were able to predict its arrival in the U.S. Now that workers' pensions are being stolen, there are finally the beginnings of protests in the streets, like in Wisconsin, Ohio, and Illinois. From CNN Money, Michigan approves plan to close half of Detroit's schools. 
more education collapsing due to budgetary constraints. 70 schools are to be closed after 59 closures the year before. Time is the most important investment a parent can make, so hopefully this will precipitate more homeschooling. Class sizes will jump to 60 students each, and the education in this circumstance pales in comparison to the already pathetic curriculum that endorses historic cover-ups and trains working-class slaves. From MSNBC, Postal Service on path to be broke by October. Unless some type of legislation is passed fast to alleviate the $5.5 billion the Postal Service is required to pay into an account to fund future retiree and medical benefits, since the Postal Service has to pay $1.3 billion for workers' compensation this year as well, they will be completely out of money if something isn't done. The head postmaster general said, if it comes down to crunch time, we will deliver the mail. Employees will be paid, as will suppliers. The thing we will not do is pay the federal government. Now from Mother Jones, it's the inequality, stupid. This is a collection of 11 graphs showing how, quote, a huge share of the nation's economic growth over the past 30 years has gone to the top one hundredth of one percent, who now makes an average of twenty-seven million per household. The average income for the bottom ninety percent of us, thirty-one thousand two hundred and forty-four dollars. One graph shows survey data of income distribution, revealing most people think it is better than it actually is. This makes me wonder what people would do if they were fully debriefed of the inequality and injustice in the U.S. As Wall Street made 720% increase in profits from 07 to 09, unemployment went up 102% and home equity fell 35%. Another telling chart shows historic tax rates for millionaires starting at around 1% in 1913. One chart shows that corporations' tax contributions have dropped massively while payroll taxes and individual income tax has accounted for the majority. Check the article out to see for yourself. The data source is mostly from the government itself and university studies. From Business Insider, looks like Ross Perot was right about the giant sucking sound. Details the loss of jobs from the U.S. to cheaper labor markets since the onset of NAFTA, affirming what Ross Perot argued against George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton in the 1992 presidential debates. NAFTA has proven to be terrible for workers in Mexico, Canada, and the United States, and has only served to make rich corporations and individuals even more wealthy. From the Associated Press, 100 accused of Medicare fraud believe the hemorrhage 60 to 90 billion a year in taxpayer money. 700 law enforcement agents launched a sting for 225 million worth of fraud. One podiatrist charged $700,000 for toenail clipping. A proctologist charged $6.5 million for hemorrhoid removals, which never happened. Medicare fraud prevention is supposed to fund Obama's radical sick care overhaul. From Reuters, many get antidepressants for no psychiatric reason. It details an overprescribing epidemic in antidepressant pharmaceuticals in this country. The study from the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry states that among individuals who took an antidepressant in the past year, 26.3% did not meet criteria for any lifetime diagnosis assessed. Respondents taking antidepressants in the absence of a lifetime diagnosis tended to be older, white, and female. These results suggest that antidepressant use among individuals without psychiatric diagnoses is common in the United States. This is a disturbing trend indeed, especially when we are reminded that selling antidepressants is a nearly $10 billion business yearly, and that as noted in our last episode, many of these drugs lead the users to extreme violence. Most all of the crazy mass shootings that happen in America are people who were on or are still on those antidepressant drugs. Now from the LA Times, court sides with USDA Monsanto over cultivation of genetically modified sugar beet seeds. The article states that the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has reversed a lower court's ruling to destroy the young plants currently being grown to produce GMO sugar beet seeds with Monsanto's Roundup Ready genes. Previous USDA permits are now given full force and effect in the ruling which states that the plaintiffs failed to prove irreparable harm the mutant plants could cause. This is a truly troubling matter, especially in light of this next story which did not make clear if the decision would be appealed to the Supreme Court. USDA National Organics Program testing for GMOs not required. As noted in our last episode, the label organic is not always as cut and dry as you would think. This article discusses the USDA's policy concerning cross-contamination of GMO crops and organic crops, which is no policy at all, it states. 
Certifying agents do not have to conduct residue tests if they do not have any reason to believe that there is a need for testing. So, for example, an organic soy processing facility was buying soybeans from domestic suppliers that were tainted with up to 20% of GMO soybeans. That company is no longer buying domestically and is importing organic soybeans from China. Way to go, American farmers. From Mother Nature Network, study links pesticides to Parkinson's disease. A study of brain imaging reveals that people exposed to the chemicals rhodinone and paraquat are 2.5 times more likely to get Parkinson's. Rhodinone is approved for use on invasive fish, but both are not approved for home and garden use due to similar studies' conclusions on animals. The study appeared in the Journal of Environmental Health Perspectives. From the Washington Post, U.S. military purchases Gulf of Mexico seafood, boosting an industry battered by oil spill. In a bid to help the embattled Gulf region's economy, the U.S. military has decided to buy large quantities of seafood to be sold in military-based grocery stores. Many consumers are still very wary of eating seafood that comes from the Gulf since the BP oil spill that contaminated the region. The government assures us that the food is safe, though, and, that they, and they have never lied before, have they? Now from the Star Tribune, food freedom back in Wyoming legislature. A bill was reintroduced in Wyoming to deregulate homegrown foods. The new version no longer has regulatory exemption for dairy or meat products since they caused the greatest concern in the first version. The first bill was turned down five to four, so hopefully this one will pass and dairy and meat product deregulation can happen separately. From the New York Times, a glow in the West Texas desert covers the story of an eccentric older gentleman with a knack for inventions and self-sustainability. John Wells has built an off-the-grid dwelling with power, water collection, and even his own bike washer, which he uses to do his laundry. This type of modern-day self-sustainable homesteading is catching on quick across the country and is an excellent way to escape the rat race and protect you and your family against upcoming natural disasters, political unrest, and government tyranny, which can often lead to food, fuel, and water shortages. Mr. Wells is an excellent example on setting up your own self-sustainable property. Now from the UK Daily Mail, whiff of a green scandal, San Francisco pours $14 million worth of bleach into the sea after eco-friendly toilets cause a stink. Saving 20 million gallons of water has been in vain as bleach was used to clean up the mess. A rotten egg stench has been imposed on areas of the city due to a backed up waste. A three year contract to use bleach to offset the issue is condemned by environmentalists. Critics offer using an enzyme solution or hydrogen peroxide instead. So far, $100 million over the past five years to upgrade its sewer system and sewage plants has been spent in part to overcome the odor problem. More proof in the putrid pudding that government stinks. If we want to save water, then we should limit our home consumption, but limiting home buying products requiring use and pollution of the vast majority. And now from the Washington Examiner, new Soros investment fund profiting off Obama's green energy push hires top Obama energy aide. Kathy Zoy casually stepped down from her position in the Department of Energy to work for Soros, who is described as such in the article's opening. Quote, George Soros, whom we're always told is not serving his own economic interests at all by promoting liberal politics and big government policies, is launching a new investment fund that plans to profit off of the green energy boom, which is entirely dependent on government subsidies supported by group Soros funds. End quote. Zoe's husband's company was even promoted by Obama as a poster child of the green industry. The husband holds 120,000 stock options, which she obviously may have profited from through her work. Typical government cronyism, ain't nothing changed. From the Globe Newswire, robot jet fighter takes first flight, aiming for aircraft carriers in 2013. In a press release from defense contractor Northrop Grumman, they have given video footage of a new jet fighter being tested by the Navy. It is called the X-47B Unmanned Combat Air System Demonstration aircraft, and it is not only unmanned, but it is entirely robotic and operates separate any human operator. This is different than the drones that are currently in use and could prove to be part of a revolutionary shift in warfare from humans to robots doing most of the killing and destruction. From the union leader, Weir police charge man for recording traffic stop, another absurdity in the police state from New Hampshire, William Alleman has been charged with felony wiretapping for leaving a voicemail as he was pulled over. 
He called Porcupine 411, an answering service for libertarian activists who are in trouble with the police. Weir Police Chief Gregory Began claims Alleman was making an audio recording of the officer without his consent. Alleman said he was followed by police officers when he left a gathering attended mostly by members of the libertarian activist group, the Free State Project. Alleman is represented by attorney Seth Hippel, who has had previous victories fighting this charge against other FSP members, Carla Gurick Ger and William Rodriguez. Clearly this is harassment and attempted deterrence to do what we all should do, record cops so that they cannot operate in the shadows. From ABC News, drug raid on band records cops conspiring to take equipment. Now, this video speaks for itself. The Action News investigators first exposed the tales of this investigation back in December. Tonight, we're breaking new ground with something even the police don't have. These guys accused of being rogue cops were actually caught on tape during a drug raid. We've got the recording, and it's not flattering for these cops who are now facing criminal charges. It's about allegations of heavy-handed and unprofessional police tactics. The lead singer, Rudy Simpson, says he was a victim of these tactics in a drug raid at his home. It all centers around this man, State Police Lieutenant Luke Davis, who's now facing corruption charges. In June of 2008, the Omni Drug Task Force, headed by Lieutenant Davis, executed a search warrant on Rudy Simpson's Monroe County home. They based the search on an anonymous tip and a marijuana stem they said they found in the garbage. When the cops came in, Rudy's band was practicing in this basement recording studio. What the police didn't know is that the microphones were hot and everything was being recorded. Take a listen. But they were mixing, and two cops take turns singing on the mic, not knowing the whole thing is being recorded. While those cops were in the basement, Rudy, his friend Jeremy, and members of the band were taken upstairs, where Lieutenant Davis and other task force members were searching the house. They were shocked by the behavior of the police. Very unprofessional. Um, almost thuggish. I felt violated and um, almost like if it was a game to them. Going into kitchen cabinets, eating cookies, and going in the refrigerator, eating stuff out of the refrigerator. It was very unprofessional. These guys say the police seemed more interested in Rudy's stuff than they were in the drugs they found. Basically, what I heard them talking about was what equipment, what uh, materialistic stuff could they take out of my house. It seems like, yeah, that they were just trying to figure out what they could come out of here with. And now, hear it for yourself, caught on the band's equipment that the cops don't know was recording. Oh, we keep a bunch of loose, right? Oh, where are we at? I guess that's Luke's call, not mine. I was just trying to get the tail on. Yeah, well, Luke comes down here and want to take everything. Band, I hear him say that quarter rounds, at least quarter rounds there. It's going to give us a chance to take all this stuff and go for the loop. Hey, uh, what do you want to take in the basement? you want to take the drums and all that? The police wound up taking three pages worth of stuff from the house, including some of Rudy's personal property, a 52-inch flat-screen TV, a DVD player, two computers, a camera, and a bunch of DVDs. Under the law, police are only supposed to confiscate property that was purchased with money earned from drug sale. But what evidence did they have that he was selling drugs? There was none. There was no sales. There was no undercover cops. There was nothing on paper. It was basically an uh, anonymous tip, they said. The Luke Davis corruption charges raised serious questions not only about the conduct of police officers, but also about Michigan's drug forfeiture laws. What drives a lot of the forfeiture abuse uh, in Michigan is the fact that under state law, law enforcement is entitled to keep 100% of all the property that they seize. In Michigan, they can even take your property without charging you with a crime. And I've learned that's what investigators are alleging happened in the Luke Davis case. Rudy Simpson claims the Omni Narcotics crew also took $400 in cash and a gold ring that was never even listed on the search warrant return. Scott Lewis, Channel 7 Action News. From op-ed news, the judicial crackdown on jury rights activists in Florida, an Orlando judge has sought to prevent fully informed jury association activists from giving brochures to jurors. In a classic example of Orwellian doublespeak, Judge Belvin Jun Perry Jr. claims that the action is for, quote, protecting the integrity of the jury system. Apparently, informing jurors of their powers, like the power to nullify laws, would, in Perry's words, quote, severely impact the court's ability to conduct efficient, proper, and prompt administration of justice. End quote. 
Criminal justice seems to be the objective, justice by criminals. FIJA asked activists to stand down until Perry's administrative order is set aside. From Lou Rockwell, zero tolerance policies. Are the schools becoming police states? This is a detailed account of many of the ridiculous things that children have been suspended, expelled, arrested, and even jailed for at schools around the country due to zero tolerance policies. There are tons of incidents listed that describe the dire state of affairs in America's schools. Incidents such as kids shooting spitballs, playing cops and robbers, having army men glued to a hat, and doodling on a desk have led to children being drug out of schools in handcuffs and being charged as criminals. It ends saying, there's an old axiom that what children learn in school today will be the philosophy of government tomorrow. As surveillance cameras, metal detectors, police patrols, zero tolerance policies, lockdowns, drug sniffing dogs, and strip searches become the norm in elementary, middle, and high schools across the nation, America is on a fast track to raising up an Orwellian generation, one populated by compliant citizens accustomed to living in a police state and who march in lockstep to the dictates of the government. Now from Wired, drones set to invade national state parks. This story exposes the new gold rush by congressional districts for a piece of the growing drone pie. An expansion in the state parks, drone bases, test sites, and educational curriculum are set to work in tandem to expand drone usage. Various forms of legislation are being introduced to implement these plans and override the Posse Comitatus Act of 1878, which prevents domestic military operations. The article concludes, quote, the dronification of America will probably continue until there is a drone aerodrome in every state and a drone degree program to go with it. Drones, drone scout jamborees and merit badges cannot be far behind. Coming soon to a summer camp near you. From MSNBC, DOJ gets reporters' phone, credit card records, and leak probe. It has recently come out that prosecutors for the Justice Department have obtained journalist James Risen's personal phone, credit, and bank records for use in the case against former CIA officer and whistleblower Jeffrey Sterling. This means that not only do the feds have the ability to look up people's individual records, even phone calls, because it's all being recorded, but they use this information to try to punish whistleblowers as well. From Press TV, Muslim U.S. citizen sues FBI for spying. Muslim U.S. citizen Yasir Afifi was in the news previously after a mechanic found tracking device in his vehicle. An Egyptian, Afifi regularly visits his family overseas and is stopped and questioned every time he travels. The suit is to protect his constitutional rights and end the surveillance and get a court order forbidding the FBI to do so again without a search warrant. Afifi is not politically active, is not connected to terrorism, and has no idea why the FBI put him under surveillance. He says, quote, I feel like my rights have been violated as an American citizen and as a student. I don't deserve to be followed or spied on whatsoever. I should be able to travel back and forth freely without being held for four hours or interrogated at all. Now I've already encountered two employers who have had to think twice before hiring me and have denied me the job due to this very incident. Now I'm not starting a fight, I'm just asserting my rights, and I hope that no one else has to go through this nonsense after me. From WMUR, Bill would make some airport screening sexual assault. In a great move by representatives in the state of New Hampshire, they have introduced a bill and have been debating it that would make the touching or viewing with a technological device of a person's breasts or genitals by a government security agent without probable cause a sexual assault. That means no more naked body scanners at airports by TSA perverts if this bill passes. Let's put their names on the sex offender registry and maybe that will tell them New, the New Hampshire means business, said Bill co-sponsor Representative Andrew Manus. More states need to get some cojones and stand up against this blatant violation of dignity like these representatives in New Hampshire. We commend you for a job well done. Keep up the fight. Now from Computer World, DHS seeks systems for covert body scans documents show. DHS wants to radiate your body and take naked pictures of you without your knowledge with so-called intelligent pedestrian surveillance platforms. The documents obtained by the Electronic Privacy Information Center repeatedly mention radiation risk, which just adds insult to injury in this breach of Fourth Amendment rights against illegal search and seizure. They would be deployed to special events to help DHS fulfill its national security goals, securing the nation for an agenda of tyranny as opposed to one of freedom. The systems have already been tested. 
From the daily DNA genetic pat-down introduced to airports by DHS, not just naked body scanners are on the table for the Department of Homeland Security this summer. They will be testing mobile DNA units at airports to take people's DNA to be stored in databases. Already the Pentagon has admitted that they have 80,000 DNA profiles of suspected terrorists. Of course, Americans wishing to fly should be put in the same database, right? Do not submit to genetic theft from tyrants. From the Daily Mail, America's shocking secret, pictures that show how U.S. experimented on its own disabled citizens and prison inmates. This article has some horrifying proof of acts most may incorrectly assume are instances isolated to madmen like Hitler. We previously covered here an apology by the U.S. government for infecting Guatemalans with syphilis 65 years ago. In America, the Associated Press reveals evidence of 40 such studies. The story says the experiments which, may, which often made healthy people sick were at best attempts to get life-saving treatments, but at worst were, quote, curiosity-satisfying experiments that hurt people but provided no useful results, end quote. Many prominent researchers felt African Americans, prisoners, and mental patients did not have full rights, subhumans, if you will. One doctor implanted testicles from livestock and even recently executed men into convicts, which was in papers and it was met with a lack of outrage. Public attitude changed following two incidents. In 1963, it was revealed 19 patients at a Jewish chronic disease hospital were injected with cancer cells. In Staten Island, from 63 to 65, mentally challenged children were infected with hepatitis to see if they could be cured. In the 70s, attitudes changed towards prisoners, which were cheaper than chimpanzees. Companies then looked to go overseas, where they are poor people with fewer rules. Definitely a disturbing article. 